Thanks to Candice for her artistry. I, I, I put the scriptures that I'm dealing with here so you can refer to them later on. We're going to emphasize. Uh, most people know what happened at Calvary and they know what happened in the resurrection, but they have no clue what happened in the grave. And some of the most beautiful things have happened in the grave. They call it Silent Saturday. I, I wouldn't call it Silent Saturday. I would call it Thunderous Saturday. Because heaven thundered in hell on Saturday. My, my topic would be the unsurpassable Christ. The unsurpassable Christ. And I give you my theme. Now, this, this word, shell shock, these words, shell shock became um, coming to use after World War I. After World War I, the phrase shell shock became very prominent. It arose because of soldiers having PTSD, post-traumatic syndrome disorder. Because of the constant bombarding and explosions and noise, when, when the soldiers were trapped, wherever they were trapped, um, they just got scared, they were frightened, they were shaken. So they, they call it shell shock. My, my topic is the unsurpassable Christ, but my theme is hell shocked. The day that hell got shocked and the devil and all his demons went into PTSD. <laughs> they have post-traumatic syndrome disorder. They are confused. They are mentally deranged. They don't know how to behave. And so they are suffering. And they want you to think that they are having a good time. No, they're not. The devils are confused. They're traumatized. Why? Because they know what's coming ahead for them. They know their fate is sealed. The devil and the angels know there's coming a day soon when he will be bound for 1,000 years and then cast into the lake of fire. When the devil reminds you of your past, you remind him of his future. He doesn't have a good one, but you do. Thunder in paradise. There are four enemies that Jesus is going to deal with in the grave. Um, he's going to deal with the spirit of the grave. As a matter of fact, there's so much scriptures I can't give you all. I'll just mention it. That even in the rapture, the shout is going to be, Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? Meaning the grave couldn't hold him down. And so he's going to deal with the spirit that controls the grave or the tomb. Then he's going to deal with the spirit or the fallen angel called death. Death is an angel and death is a place. And you will see death and hell. Death and hell, there are angels. They are gods of the underground, of Sheol. Sheol means... Oh, you don't see it there. But Sheol refers to the underground compartments of departed spirit. Divided into two, a great gulf fixing between hell on one side, paradise on the other, called Abraham's bosom. So he is going to deal with these. And uh, let's see what happens as I take you from scripture to scripture. This is a textual sermon, not an expository one. So I'll be running four texts, and uh, you have them in your printout. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12 and, and catch a few verses there. I, are you following me so far? Okay. Anytime you're not following me, raise your hand and wave. Jesus was talking to the Pharisees. Uh... Master, we want to see a sign from you. And you know, signs are good, but when people want to see a sign before they believe, it's not good. You can't see to believe. You have to believe to see. And so, let's see. 
But he answered unto them and said, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Look how he, look how he described them. What would he say today? Ooh. There shall be no sign given to you but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Here Jesus is acknowledging that Jonah existed while critics say that Jonah is a, a, a fable that there could never be a fish that big to swallow a man. Well, not too long after, in the 1900s, they found a whale tossed up on the seashore with two, it died because he swallowed two horses. Overeaten, you can, you can always Google it. So the, the capacity of the whale's stomach is very large. It's nothing uh, impossible, somebody said. Not only can God make a whale to swallow a Jonah, he can make our Jonah to swallow a whale. All things are possible. <laughs> so he acknowledged the fact that Jonah existed. And now he's going to use Jonah as a typology. And, and you can't take verse 40 and not take the rest of the verses that I will be quoting. For as Jonah was three days. If he had stopped there, we would understand it is three 12-hour days. No. Three days and three nights. As 72 hours in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. If anybody knew where hell and paradise was, it was Jesus. Located somewhere in the center of the earth, heart of the earth. And experiments have been done as some people have been drilling, drilling for miles into the core of the earth. Only to find that the closer they get to the core, the hotter it becomes. I could only say what Jesus said. I'm not going to be scientific or anything like that. It's just the theology of it. Three days and three nights. The queen of the south shall rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. Back up. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented. That's a wonderful word. They repented of the preaching of Jonas. Today people don't repent, they just compliment. What a great sermon that was, Pastor. No, we, we, we thank you for the compliment, but what we need to see is change. Repentance. Change. And that's what God is looking for, change. They repented at the preaching of Jonas. Behold, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen from the south shall rise up against this generation. I think that was Sheba. And, and listen to the wisdom. She came from far to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. And he said, behold, a greater than Solomon is here. I want you to know. Name any person in history, and I will guarantee you that Jesus can be confidently described as greater. He is greater than anybody who have lived because he was God manifested in the flesh. He came down from heaven so that we from earth can go up to heaven. Hallelujah. Say, he's greater. He's greater than my troubles. He's greater than my problems. He's greater than anything that surrounds me. I serve a great God. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Say great is or confess that the Lord you serve is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. Ephesians 4. He is great. It discontinues to be explained by Paul. Ephesians 4. Verse 7. Everyone is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. It, it simply means that everybody has a gift. Every one of you have a gift. You can't make the scripture a liar. You have been given a gift. And uh, I remember one time. Somebody gave me a gift. But I didn't have time to open the little box. I said, what's in that little box? I like big boxes. <laughs> and so 
I, I just left it there because it was probably busy. When I finally opened it, there was a smaller box. And inside the box was a smaller box. You see, listen, I don't like small boxes. And it's getting smaller and smaller. When I finally got to the small box, there was $500 in it. Don't describe or despise the size of the gift. Because you do not realize the gift that you have until you open it, examine it, and see what God has given you. You probably have something so expensive inside of you, money cannot buy, and nobody can compare it. Search yourself, find your gift, and operate in your gift. Hallelujah. Wherefore, it is said, when he ascended on high... He led captivity captive and give gifts unto men. Now he that ascended, what is it but he that also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended far above all heavens that he might fulfill all things. What is that saying? Go back to the slide. If you can. Sorry to work you so hard. He that, he left the, his body was in the tomb. His soul went into Sheol, not the hell part, but Abraham's bosom. And for three days and three nights, he preached into the spirits, according to people that was in captivity. And so what he did, after preaching, he, he snatched, this is Hebrews, he destroyed the pain of death. He took away the gain of death. He mastered the underground. And I'm coming to the best part. So what he did is that he... Well, let me, let me don't go there. Leave that there. I have to go to, uh, to Psalms 24. Psalms 24. A prophetic glimpse into this scenario. And in Psalms 24, 7 says, Lift up your heads. O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. <laughs> Who is this king of glory? Now, the gates represents the authority. Gates always represent authority. These are the... I know I'll keep you busy today. These were the watchmen, the guards at the gates of hell and paradise of Sheol. And so when they saw him coming, they saw the glory of God invested and they'd never seen anything like this because they've been down there for a long time. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. You guys for 4,000 years had them captive. The Lord strong in battle. He's coming to fight. And he's coming to take prisoners and set them free. Hallelujah. So two things I want you to know before we come out of there is he said, lift up your heads. Lift, I'm, I'm, I'm going to apply this to you. Lift up your heads. You've been looking too much down. You've been looking at the ground. You've been looking, you're walking like this. You're looking at your friends. You're looking at the doctor. You're looking at people. You're looking at prophetic announcements. Hey, there is something higher than that. Isaiah said, I saw the Lord. Hallelujah. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the glory of the Lord filled his temple. It was that king of glory who came down marching triumphantly into the bowels of the earth and said, let my people go. And he set captives free. And he gave gifts to them. That's what kings would do. When kings uh, entered into a city triumphantly, they will uh, just give gifts to everybody to show the largesse of, of their, their booty and their bounty. Lift up your heads. I am asking you, you know, since I've been reading the scripture, every time I go in the shower, 
I have my towel on top, and I lift up my head, and, and I say, oh, God, what a reminder. I lift up my eyes. I lift up my head. I want to see you high and lift it up. I want to see you, you know. I have rearranged this scripture according to commentaries and other translations. And it, it, it's not as the King James would say it, although you may think so. From whence cometh my help? Shall I look unto the hills? You see, all the false gods and idols, they always occupied the mountains. They always were up on the hills so that people would see them anytime they walk. And so the psalmist says, you think I should look to those gods and to those idols and to those temples? From whence cometh my help? My help, by the way, he says, comes from the Lord. And an emphasis who made, who created the heavens and the earth. That's a by the way statement. My Lord and my helper is the God who created the heavens and who created the earth. What an awesome God. It's to him I will look. And when you look to him, you look no further. It's good to go to the doctor and thank God for our medical people here. We love you and we need you. But if it's only to the medical profession we look, we need to look a little higher. Higher, higher, higher. Lift up Jesus higher because God had lifted him up and given him a name that every name shall bow of things in heaven, of things on earth, and of things beneath the earth. And they had to bow because the king of glory came in. Hallelujah. I am going to say to you, open your doors and let the king of glory come in. Open your homes and let the king of glory come in. Open your churches and let the king of glory come in. Open your mind and let the king of glory come in. So that your life will be filled with the glory of God. Hey, I miss you. That's a whole beautiful family there. And my last scripture is Colossians, and Mick is doing such a beautiful job in Colossians, Mick. You're awesome. Colossians 2, and Colossians is one of my favorite books. I'm going to apply this and finish. What does the cross and the resurrection have to do with us? How can we apply this piece of theology? Well, Colossians helps us. Buried, verse 12, 2, 12. Buried with him in baptism. When you were water baptized, and uh, I didn't get to say it, but last Sunday, Easter Sunday, made me 56 years water baptized. Oh, hallelujah! And spirit filled. And I could humbly say, and I say this with great humility, I never once backslid. Never once. Never once grew cold. Never once left the Lord and walked away. I did a lot of wrong, stupid, foolish things, of course. But I never backslid. Because when I was filled with the Holy Spirit that same week, I remember the Tuesday night very clearly. I wasn't 17 years yet. Because I didn't go into Bible school. And I hugged the chair in a little prayer meeting with about six people and I couldn't let the chair go. It was so much power that's coming. I almost crushed the chair. I wrapped up uh, melodies of praise and ring it up. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just feeling power. <laughs> that was Tuesday night. Wednesday night we had a, a, a regular Wednesday night under a house. I was in the back row and I will never forget I was singing some song and then suddenly I broke out in tongues and I kept on speaking in tongues and I was so excited. I didn't want to stop speaking in tongues. I didn't talk to nobody. I jumped on my bike and I rode a mile away still speaking in tongues and 56 years have passed away and I'm still speaking in tongues. Hallelujah. Thank God for the gift of tongues. Hallelujah. So we were buried with him, and we also rose with him to the fate of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. And you, 
make it personal now, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, had to quicken together with him. Quicken means to bring alive. Together when Jesus became alive, we who were in him became alive, having forgiven all your trespasses. Oh, you are clean. He, 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 the doctrine of justification and regeneration and sanctification all come into the doctrine of salvation. But here is where he justified you. It's a legal term used in the courtroom. When they see the list of charges, the judge puts an X on them and say, forgiven. All is cleared. You have a new record now. That's what he did for you. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Not only did he do that, but he wants to do that for you today. There are some things in your life he wants to take away. Let him take it away. Take away your troubles. Take away your sleeplessness. Take away the anxiety. Take away the fear. Take away the worry about tomorrow and next month bills. Oh, give it to him. Let him take it away and nail it. Nail it to the cross. Hallelujah. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made an open show of them. Let uh, me go into this wonderful analogy that, uh, what does it mean to spoil principalities? And who are the principalities? Those are the four principalities that we talk about. Death, the spirit of grave, hell, and the underground. Abraham's bosom. Throw back it up. And what Jesus did, he moved paradise from beneath and took it upstairs to be by his side. So that when a believer dies now, he doesn't go down there. He goes up there to be absent from the body. To be absent from the body. It to be present. Paul said, I saw a man in the third heavens in paradise. Upstairs. Downstairs have gone upstairs now. Hallelujah. To spoil means to disrobe, to take off your armor, to leave you almost unclothed and naked as a soldier. And this is what Jesus did. He disarmed the principalities. He took away their power. He took away their authority. In so much that he cried with a loud shining face and a loud voice in Revelation 1 saying, I am he that was dead and behold, I am alive and I'm alive forevermore. And I've got the keys of death and hell. I am the authority over the underground and behold, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth and beneath the earth let us rejoice we have an unsurpassable Christ we have an unmeasurable Christ we have a Christ who went down and broke the chains of death and took us out and transported us into his kingdom out of the kingdom of darkness he said in Gethsemane, now is your hour and now is the power of darkness. They had their hour, <laughs> but he has their eternity. So, spoiled principalities and made an open show of them. I'm sure you read it and have read it several times on the different accounts, but I'll just give you, forgive me if I mix up some of the facts. Helen of Troy. Helen was, according to the legend, the most beautiful woman in the world. Who knows? She had 11 husbands. I mean, come on. Make Hollywood look good. 
Her fifth husband was Paris. Paris was a prince in Troy. How she got there, either by kidnapping or whatever the reasons. Achilles, king, king who was named Menelaus. He was king of Sparta, and he was a good friend of Achilles. Hector was a great warrior in Troy. So instead of killing everybody, they decide to have a one-to-one -one combat. Achilles and Hector. And Prime and Paris was the husband of Helen at the time. They were all watching from the wall. Some military strategists told Achilles, take your spear. There is a, a naked spot in Hector's neck where the armor is not. Put your poison spear there. He did. And Hector immediately succumbed to the poison, fell down in his chariot. Prem, the two princes of Troy, Prem and Paris, begged Achilles for the body, give him a, a decent burial. He wouldn't. He tied his body to the back of his chariot and paraded around the city of Troy, openly showing his triumph and victory over Hector. And that is what Jesus did. You couldn't see it, but the powers of darkness that gathered around Calvary and around the tomb saw the glory of God, how Jesus single-handedly, by the power of the Spirit, dragged Satan and discomforted them and left them a PTSD. They're still struggling from that blow. Glory to God in the highest. We serve the unsurpassable Christ. Give him glory, all you people. Know your Jesus. And that same Jesus is coming back again to take us. And we will say like the songwriter while passing through the air. We will say farewell, farewell. Sweet hour of prayer. Gone to never come back to a world of misery. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Hell shock was shell shocked by the glory of his presence. It's a lot more I can say. But let's give God the praise. If you know this unsurpassable Christ, I'm going to ask you to stand. And let's give him some praise. Let's thank God he's not in the grave. He defeated the four powers that were there. Give him glory. Come on, let's praise. Open, open, open up and praise the Lord. Just thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, King of glory. Come in, King of glory. Come in. We open the doors, King of glory. Go ahead, clap, clap for the King of glory. As he comes in, let him come in, come in. Come in, Lord Jesus. Come, come, come. Oh, I lift up my head. I lift up my eyes. I see you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. I prophesy to you the word of the Lord. That if you lift up your head you will see the greater glory of God. Amen. If you open your door, the king of glory will come in. Amen. Oh, let the glory of God come into your heart and to your life. Uh, like I said, we can talk a lot more about glory. I told you there are 40 sermons trapped in this journey. But I give you the meat. May God bless your week as you see the king in all his splendor. Remember, he is the unsurpassable Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah.